Hello, my name is Dr. Luke Rendell and I'm a reader in biology here at the University of St. Andrews. I'm very happy to be speaking to you as part of this Cultural Evolution Society module on animal cultures about the cultural lives of cetaceans. Just a quick note on the teaching style, I'm going to go relatively rapidly through quite a lot of material, but there are copious uh, references embedded within the lecture slides that you can then use to follow up uh, for more detail in your own time. So I want to start with the animals themselves and some observations of things that we know they do. Okay, and uh, this is a paper I was involved in uh, last year. <clears throat> and this dolphin you see uh, in the, the slide uh, is uh, the center of this particular story. She is called Billy. And she was taken into captivity in the mid-1980s after being found in a pretty sorry condition in, in a harbor. And she was housed for some time with um, other dolphins who were used as part of a trained dolphinarium show. And while she was in this captive facility, although she didn't receive any training herself, she started to develop this behavior that you see in the, in the uh, slide called tail walking, where the animal propels itself up out of the water. And this is part of the dolphin show put on by the captive dolphins, but Billy herself was never trained in this. So she must have acquired it by observing and learning from the other dolphins that she was housed with. The interesting thing is that once she was rehabilitated, Billy was released back into the wild and other dolphins in her population then started also showing this behavior. Okay, so the data plotted here show observer effort and the number of days of tail walking and the number of individuals tail walking over uh, a 20-year monitoring period. And we can see that where Billy uh, was released in 1995, there's just a small uh, amount of activity. Uh, but then after 2005, there's a really big burst in the, in the community of animals showing this tail walking behavior. And the interesting thing is, uh, or one of the interesting things is, is, is that this is when Billy, the original dolphin who introduced the behavior into the population, uh, is known to have died. So after this animal died, uh, animals in this population started showing this behavior um, uh, a great deal. But the key point from our cultural perspective is that this is a behavior that was trained in captive animals, inadvertently transferred to a temporarily captured animal, and then released, if you like, back into the wild, and we can see that it spreads through the population. So it's like a natural experiment. <clears throat> Another observation I want to highlight to you uh, at the start of this lecture uh, is of the extreme synchrony that male, male bottlenose dolphins in alliances in some populations around the world show when they are behaving together. So male alliances are a peculiarity of some bottlenose dolphin populations and they occur when uh, two or three males form very strong social bonds and cooperate and work together uh, in order to uh, extract mating opportunities in what we would uh, um, consider to be rather brutal circumstances uh, from females in these populations. Okay, So I'm going to play this video here and you're going to show the degree of synchrony that these animals show in their displays. Wow, wow sink leap. How, How cool is that? that? And another example. I'm grateful to Richard Connor for these videos. And what they show, I think, in conjunction with the study on tail walking, is that the, these animals, bottlenose dolphins, have a really strong inclination and ability to mimic and copy each other's behaviors. And I think the relevance of this to the topic of our lecture uh, should be pretty obvious. OK, so we think there are some things to investigate out there in the world, but we need some conceptual tools. Now I know that other lectures in this course have uh, delivered some of that to you, so I'm simply going to do what I think everybody should in this uh, interdisciplinary research area uh, and just give you my definition of culture, okay, the one that I'm working to, which is information or behavior shared by population or subpopulation acquired through some form of social learning. This is a broad definition of culture that is used widely amongst evolutionary biologists and, uh, and some psychologists, some anthropologists. Uh, as well, uh, but there are some people uh, in the academy who would object to that definition as being overly broad. For example, it does not include uh, any sense of cultural meaning or the meanings that are attached to cultural traits, cultural behaviors in human societies. Um, 
But we can't really interrogate these in non-humans, so uh, we are taking a, a functional approach as opposed to uh, the, the a, 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 as indicated here. And what I want to put across to you in this talk is uh, really largely a resume of a much longer treatment. Uh, I wouldn't be a proper academic if I didn't advertise my book, and here it is, uh, along with Hal Whitehead, who also teaches on this course, The Cultural Lives of Whales and Dolphins. And in that book, uh, we make the case for why we think in some species of whale and dolphin, at least, culture is vital. And what do we mean by vital? Well, in this case, we mean that in order to develop into a uh, and survive and prosper in the terms of reproduction as an adult in these societies, you, you need a significant learned cultural input during your development. Animals that don't do that don't develop into fully functioning adults in their society. I'd like to start as also by acknowledging that a lot of the work I present uh, is done in collaboration, as so much of this science is uh, with these individuals here who are colleagues, collaborators, PhD students, uh, and ex-students as well. Um, <clears throat> oh, I apologise for the slightly errant reference in the middle of this, but the point of this slide is that uh, we have a variation in cetacean societies that we know about in social structure. And it's a very interesting topic to then combine this knowledge of social structure with uh, what we know about the dynamics of cultural transmission. So, so in humpback whales, uh, these are the four species we're going to be talking about mostly in this talk. In humpback whales, you have a very uh, homogenous social structure. Everyone hangs out with everyone a little bit. And at the other extreme, you have the sperm whales, where you have these very tight uh, uh, social bond groups called units that sometimes affiliate with each other and also share contact with the mature males, which are indicated by uh, the open circles in this diagram. So these are standard social network diagrams where each node, each uh, symbol is an individual and the lines connect can reflect the strength of their social bonds. And you see within cetaceans this variety. And it's a really interesting question to, to try and understand how this variety in social structure might produce diverse uh, phenomena in the uh, cultural sphere as well. So we're going to go through three primary groups and the kinds of evidence that we find in each of them. The small odontocetes, where we're going to look at foraging traditions and signature whistles. The baleen whales, where we're going to look at humpback song and lobtail feeding. And then the larger, some of the larger odontocetes that live in very long, stable groups, which turn out to be a very uh, uh, potent vehicle for, for cultural phenomena in these societies. <coughs> Excuse me. So starting with small odontocetes, what... A lot of focus has gone on to, in this particular uh, area, is on, is on foraging tradition. So if you look at just one species, the bottlenose dolphin, as we have previously, actually it's not just a case of dolphins eat fish. There are many ways in which they can extract their nutrition from the coastal habitats in which they uh, largely live. And I've given you a list of ones here. Beaching, kaplunking, mud, reed fe mud ring feeding, hydroplaning, and cooperative fishing. Uh, and the nice thing about these behaviours is they're very striking and they're, they're very popular topics for nature documentaries. So there are a string of videos you can watch linked to in this slide to actually see what these behaviours are rather than spending a lot of time describing them. And then here's a reference you can follow up to uh, get a sort of overview uh, of this question, this, this phenomenon of foraging traditions. But there are many populations where they develop uh, distinct uh, foraging uh, tactics and these vary from place to place and also within the same general habitat. So two are shown in this slide. The first is sponging, where bottlenose dolphins in Shark Bay in Australia carry conical sponges on their nose, and this is thought to protect them when they forage by bottom grubbing. Uh, here is bottom grubbing in action. This is a dolphin digging its nose into the sand in order to uh, rouse out a fish that it has detected through echolocation buried in the seabed. <coughs> One particularly interesting example, I think, where we just have an observation of a behaviour, um, but we don't know very much else about its development, but this is obviously an area where it would be very good to have ongoing research, is this, uh, this behaviour of cuttlefish processing, which is shown in one place, the Upper Spencer Gulf in southern Australia, that we're aware of, and it involves a complex series of behaviours in order to process what starts out as a relatively unpalatable food item into something which is highly nutritious. And they do this because there is a seasonal glut of these animals as they come and focus on this particular area to spawn. And the process goes like this. Okay? The first problem you've got, is if you want to eat your cuttlefish, is that they have this defensive ink, and that ink actually contains compounds which are upsetting to mammalian digestive systems. 
um, and, it, and, it, and so they're aversive in that way. So the dolphin first kills the cuttlefish and then takes it into the water column and shakes it until the ink is released. And then it slams it back down against the bottom and rubs the back uh, of the animal against the bottom until the cuttle bone, which is sort of just calcium and you don't want to eat it, uh, is released and then they're just left with the flesh of the animal. So if you look at a complex sequence like this, uh, it's very hard to uh, think about how one animal could produce all that itself and yet there's a whole population of them doing it. So this is just to get across the idea there's lots that we still have to learn about these animals. Here are some uh, examples too which I've already alluded to. Uh, the, the tail walking and the synchrony and there's another one actually in Shark Bay where some animals carry these conch shells on their nose for reasons that uh, we're still not 100% sure uh, as to why but maybe similar to the sponging. So there are multiple examples of these idiosyncratic behaviours uh, and the examples of the dolphin's ability to copy and imitate in the wild that we think give rise to these foraging traditions and that have allowed this species to colonise virtually every coastal habitat uh, on the planet with all the differences in, uh, that, that, that that ensues. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about humpback whales. Uh, here's a picture of some humpback whales in case you don't know what they look like, uh, but they're very iconic animals. And I'm going to discuss one particular study that I was involved in, which kind of illustrates many of the challenges and opportunities that we have when studying cultural behaviour in these animals. So, humpbacks have a very common feeding tactic uh, called bubble net feeding or, or bubble feeding where they dive down to underneath their prey and then blow bubbles underneath them and use that to maneuver the prey or herd the prey in particular ways that are advantageous to them and then when they've done that uh, they lunge up to the surface through this bubble cloud and collect a large mouthful in which the prey are concentrated. Okay? Um, now in one particular place, the Gulf of Maine, in one particular summer, 1980, uh, some scientists observed animals adding a particular, uh, uh, another segment to this sequence, which is a, a lob tail or a, a kick of the tail just as the animal dies in order to agitate the, the water at the surface. We don't know why exactly they do this, but it seems that it creates the same kind of surface layer of bubbles uh, that might work with their um, herding their prey, and we'll explore that a bit in a, in a minute. Okay? The interesting thing is that this behavior spread. Okay, So over an almost 30 year study period, here are all the events, uh, the feeding events that were observed over that study period. So this data were collected by whale watching vessels with observers on board going out for every summer for uh, in excess of 25 years. And these are all the feeding events they observed. And these black dots are the ones where um, this kick or this lob tail uh, was observed as well. And you see immediately there's a very clear spatial pattern here. This behavior is pretty much confined to an area called the Stellwagen Bank, which is an area of uh, raised seabed, which is very, very productive uh, in fisheries terms. It's actually a national marine sanctuary uh, in the United States, and here's the bathymetry associated with it. We analyzed over 73,000 sighting records of about 650 individuals. And what's really interesting about this lobtail feeding behavior is it's first seen in 1980, uh, by a scientist who wasn't working on this on this team, so we don't actually have the data for this. But then, if we look at each year, the proportion of animals in the population that have been seen doing this lobtail feeding at least once, that steadily increases over the study period from virtually nobody to almost half the population. Okay? And so it seems like this behaviour spread. It also seems to be associated with ecological shifts. So we have here plotted in green uh, research trawl data on the abundance of a particular prey species called sand lance in green. Uh, and then the frequency in that year of uh, lobtail feeding events. So the proportion of feeding events that were observed that were of this lobtail feeding. And you see that the, uh, the inception of this behavior is associated with a very large population boom in sand lance, okay? So a new prey species becoming available in large numbers seems to have prompted the addition of this lobtail to the, to the feeding strategy. And then this population crashes, uh, the, the sand lance population goes down again, and the behavior doesn't really take off until the next boom in sand lance, right? Uh, and that one is uh, only half as big as the other one, and it's possibly only half as big because the, the whales respond by doing this lobtail feeding a lot. So it seems like they're focusing on this prey. And then uh, later on in the time series, you see that the whales almost respond almost immediately to any slight rise in the number of sand lances by increasing the amount of lobtail feeding they're doing. Uh, and this 
may even be suppressing population booms in the, the sandlands prey. So there's an ecological factor going on here as well, right? The prey availability uh, spectrum has changed, and so maybe this is just the animals responding to that. But there does seem to be a spread aspect to the behavior as well. And when we plot the social network of these animals, we get this amorphous blob because it's a very unstructured social uh, network. But <clears throat> we see that uh, if we lay out the network as we have done here using spring embedding where the uh, links that are the animals that have the most social links are drawn towards the center of the cluster and the animals that have fewer are spread out uh, towards the periphery okay we can see immediately there seems to be some kind of relationship between being central to the social network and acquiring uh, this lobtail feeding behavior and so we wanted to analyze that in a quantitative way and we did it uh, in conjunction with Will Hoppet um, uh, who developed this technique, uh, we did it using network-based diffusion analysis. Right? So just to briefly summarize what that is, it's uh, conceptually the argument goes like this. If you have an animal that comes up with a new behavior in a population, uh, like this uh, blue one here, okay, and that behavior is a, is a useful one and goes on to spread in the population, you can look at that population, that you can look at the dynamics of that spread and make inferences about how the mechanisms underlying that spread. Okay, so. For example, if this is the innovating animal, okay, and the next two animals to acquire the behavior are the closest to that one on the social network, they have the strongest bonds linking them between them, then that is a clue that social transmission is important. Whereas a contrasting case might be where this is the next animal to acquire the behavior, and this animal is pretty distant on the social network from the innovator. So this would suggest that social transmission is less important. So it's the idea that in, if a behavior is spreading through social transmission, then it should map relatively well onto the social network. The actual maths of it looks like this, okay? It's a function which incorporates the strength of uh, a potential social learning effect uh, multiplied by the association uh, of the focal individual with in currently informed individuals. Uh, and then you can also put in individual attributes like age and sex into the model, okay? But the take home message is really that when we ran uh, the different permutations of these models that you could imagine representing different kinds of social learning processes, the models under a, an information theoretic analysis uh, attracted virtually no Akaiki weight uh, in the model sets that were tested. Okay, So that's 1.8 to the minus 23, uh, almost no support whatsoever for models that don't include social transmission. So we concluded that social transmission, social learning was important in the spread of this behavior. Okay. Now that's not the only cultural behavior that humpbacks show. Um, <clears throat> in many ways, we can think of uh, the archetypal example of cultural evolution in human societies has been this cumulative process where we go from biplanes to jetliners. But there are also cultural changes which are not so obviously associated with improvements, okay? And these are cultural evolution of aesthetic factors. And we have a kind of parallel to this in humpback societies as well, which is uh, humpback whale song, okay? So let's see if I can play you a little bit. And as that plays in the background, I'll go on to explain why we think this song is culturally transmitted, and that's largely to the work of my colleagues Ellen Garland and Mike Noad. Um, so they've studied in great detail the song produced by various breeding populations in the South Pacific uh, over the last um, 20 years. Okay, so, uh, and their findings can be summarized in the figure I'm about to reveal to you. But first we'll focus on one population, the breeding population of Eastern Australia, um, which I should point to with my pointer. And in this, uh, humpbacks don't give their songs convenient names, so we assign them colors as, the, as possibly the easiest way to be able to discuss them and refer to them rather than calling them the whoop, whoop, moan, groan song, we call it the black song or the blue song or the red song or the yellow or green, okay? And what we see here is that in this Eastern Australian population, roughly every two years, the population throws out its song and starts singing a new one, okay? So in 1999, they threw out the black song and started singing the blue song in 2000 and so forth. Um, down the time. Now what's really interesting, if you look at the songs 
uh, across time and space over this uh, massive study area, you see this really interesting pattern where the songs are not just being chucked out by one population, but they are also being acquired by neighbouring populations. So this blue song was acquired by the Eastern Australian population in 2000. Okay, uh, 2001 it transferred across to New Caledonia, and then by 2003 it reached French Polynesia, by which time the Eastern Australian population had moved on to the red song. Okay, so these animals live for 40 or 50 years, and there's no way you can explain this pattern in any other way than the animals are learning their songs from each other. But the scale and scape of this kind of cultural transmission phenomenon is absolutely staggering. And there's so many questions we still have to answer about it. Where do these songs come from? We know that a lot of them come from Western Australia, but where do the Western Australian comes, come from? What happens in the rest of the South Pacific, uh, for example? What happens over here? Does this transmission carry on and carry on? And why are these animals so attracted to novel songs every few years? These are open research questions that I and my colleagues are working on right now. <clears throat> and do the, do the humpbacks think that there's anything obviously better uh, in, in French Polynesia? Do they think there's anything obviously better with this light blue song compared to the purple song that they had before? <clears throat> right, I'm going to move on from humpback whales now and talk about uh, sperm whales, which is a species I've uh, spent a lot of time working on myself personally. Uh, and I'm going to play you a sound of some sperm whales exchanging uh, what we believe are social communication signals. distinctive patterns of clicks that you hear are called coders and they are stereotyped patterns of clicks that are made in situations which lead us to believe that they are social signals. Okay? Um, how do we know much about sperm whale societies? Here's a, a time lapse of what it's actually uh, really like, uh, just a few hours in the life of a research vessel and the key point here is that we're in the middle of a social group of sperm whales they're all around us under the water, but they spend so little time on the surface, you'll be hard pushed to actually spot an animal in uh, this video. This is over a two or three hour period where we did see animals, but the proportion of time they spend at the surface means that you just don't catch them in this kind of time lapse. You've already missed it, in fact. <coughs> but by following the animals, we get, take pictures of their tails and we can identify them as individuals, have we, as we have done here. Uh, and we've learned that these individuals uh, uh, live in uh, tightly bonded social units that appear to last for their entire lives and young f f sperm whales are born into these units but it's only the adult females that remain. Males leave and they have a very different lifestyle to the females but we're going to concentrate on the female groups here because these seem to be the substrate for cultural transmission in this species. Why do we think coders are social signals? Well they're separated in space and time from feeding signals and so sperm whales echolocate to create to to find their prey at depth and you can see in red and blue the foraging activity and the sound associated with it according to a, a, um, a nearly 24 hour uh, suction cup tag record and then the coda occurrence is much more at the surface the beginning and the end of dives okay so there's a clear separation in space and time therefore they're, these signals are performing some kind of function um, that's to that's necessary at the surface more than at depth but what I found particularly interesting and spent a lot of my career doing is mapping sperm whale coda diversity in different places in the world. And we find very interesting patterns when we do this. In the Mediterranean, for example, all the sperm whales you hear will make a coda that sounds like this. A three plus one pattern, okay, and we call it the three plus one. Not very imaginative, but it is at least descriptive. Whereas in the Caribbean, the repertoires are dominated by this type. Okay, what we call a 1 plus 1 plus 3. Uh, in the Galapagos and the Eastern Tropical Pacific. We hear these regular space clicks. And then, um, more recently, we've heard from uh, Brazilian waters a, a more complex rhythm. Uh, 
And true to form for Brazilians, their rhythms are more complex, and we have struggled to find a descriptive name for this one, so we will just call it the Brazilian for the time being. My thanks to Tiago Amarim for sharing these recordings with me. Uh, so we have this diversity, sperm whales in different places make different coders, but in fact it's more complicated than that because we've since gone on to find that sperm whales in the same place sometimes make uh, different coders, right? So some of the groups you hear around the Galapagos make this six regular, others make a coder that sounds like this. Five, one. Okay, so this 5 plus 1 pattern, and some groups which make a, a really short coder type diagnostically. Okay, so I'm going to take you through this rather complicated diagram slowly, okay, to show you what it represents, but it's a representation of the coder repertoires of different sperm whale social units around the Galapagos Islands, okay? And what we see immediately is that there are two broad divisions in the dialects, okay, between these groups marked in green and these groups marked in red, in blue. And there's one group marked in red. Each row, each column in this table, okay, represents the repertoire of one particular social unit. Uh, and each row represents the occurrence or not of each uh, coder type identified in the study uh, in that particular social unit, all right? And the filled in symbols are showing you where the rep these coder types made up at least 10% of the repertoire, typically much higher proportions. Uh, and so they are the ones that dominate the repertoire. And so the green coders here, the, the green groups here, are all groups that have a repertoire dominated by these regular coders, whereas the blue are all groups that have this repertoire dominated by the, these plus one types. And this is the, this T unit over here in red is the only example of the short clan that we recorded in this particular uh, data set. Okay? And so you can see that you can divide the population here based on their acoustic repertoire uh, into very distinct groups that we term vocal clans. And uh, this is just illustrating uh, how that works. We've also interestingly found that if we look at the foraging success as, as measured rather simply by defecation rates, uh, we see that these different clans in these islands have different foraging success, suggesting that they also have different foraging tactics or strategies. So, for example, in uh, 1989, which we're, we're going to look at first because it's the normal ecological conditions year, okay, the regular clan had almost twice the foraging success of the plus one clan. Uh, and, but it, you can contrast this with 1987, which was a Nino year, so everyone did poorly. Okay, El Nino is when cold water currents fail to arrive at the Galapagos Islands and therefore don't generate the upwelling which generates the productivity that these animals ultimately depend on. Uh, so when it fails, everyone does badly, but the ranks here are reversed. So the plus one clan seems to have a more slow and steady approach where it can continue to um, do okay in challenging conditions, even though it doesn't do as well as the other clan when conditions are good. So it's a kind of bet hedging uh, situation that we suspect might be going on between the two different clans. Okay. But there's more to the Galapagos story than this as well, because this study period ended roughly around uh, the year 2000 when uh, sperm whale densities around the Galapagos Islands collapsed for reasons we don't fully understand. And it wasn't until um, the mid-2010s that we got enough reports of sperm whales being around the islands that we decided to go back, and we did indeed find sperm whales around the Galapagos Islands. But their vocal repertoires were completely different. There were two different vocal clans that had moved into the waters that had been abandoned by the regular and plus one animals. We don't understand what drives these processes. Uh, if they were human societies, you might call it history, uh, or you might call it, um, uh, yeah, you might call it, you might call it history. But we don't understand what drives one particular vocal dialect group away uh, and what brings a different vocal dialect group in. <coughs> And uh, so we published this and, and we, we titled the paper Cultural Turnover Among Galapagos Sperm Whales. And what I should really say is that there are reasons to do with studies of genetics and uh, the fact that these animals are sympatric for really thinking that coded repertoires are a culturally transmitted dialect. Okay, The genetics just don't map onto uh, the social structure or the, the vocal dialect whatsoever, so it's not a valid explanation for what's going on here. A lot of what we know about sperm whales comes from this Dominica sperm whale project led by my colleague Shane Gero. And here again we find that 
there is uh, interesting patterns in the in the dialect diversity among among sperm whales groups. Okay, so most of the animals in this project uh, have this one plus one plus three coda type that dominates their repertoire. Okay, and you see it you see it here. But then there are two other units that we, that we know about in our data set which have a, quite a different uh, vocal dialect. So again, we've got evidence for two different dialect groups sharing the same habitat. Okay, and there are social ca consequences to this. So this is another social network diagram of this population. But you see all the units that belong to the one plus one plus three clan outlined in green, and the strength of the social bonds between them. And then there are these two in red, which are really quite socially isolated from the rest of the population. So we have social structure mapping on to this kind of cultural variation in coded dialects in these societies. Right. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about culture in cetaceans is that, that we think that it is stable enough and persistent enough, especially in these group type situations, that it can actually get us into the territory where we can start thinking about gene culture coevolution. So in their book, Not By Genes Alone, Richardson and Boyd stated that culture has led to fundamental changes in the way that our species responds to natural selection. Uh, but we argue that this is also going on in cetacean populations. We put this evidence, uh, along with evidence for uh, similar processes in other animal species, into a recent uh, review. One example that has been around for quite a while is Hal Whitehead's uh, cultural selection and gen genetic diversity, or his cultural hitchhiking hypothesis, okay, which I believe he will, he will discuss in his lecture. Uh, what I wanted to highlight here was another species which uh, is, has populations around the world and also has a rich diversity of foraging tactics and uh, also prey target types, okay? so, and this is the killer whale. So killer whales have a, a, a cosmopolitan uh, approach to making uh, their living around the world. Okay? There are populations uh, off North America, uh, the Pacific Northwest, where some uh, animals specialize on uh, small cetaceans and others specialize on salmon. There are populations in Norway and Iceland that specialize on herding herring cooperatively. The, the famous uh, beach hunting that occurs at the Crozo Islands and the Peninsula Valdez. In New Zealand, animals have learned, these animals have learned to uh, take stingrays by flipping them upside down and rendering their sting uh, useless as a defense. Uh, in South Africa, Animals chase down small dolphins, the killer whales chase down small dolphins. And in Antarctica, there are at least four different ecotypes, we suspect, each with their own specialized diet. And that's the key thing. While globally, there's a diversity, if you look at any one particular killer whale group, they have a very specialized and very conservative diet. Okay, so for example, these are, this is the diet estimates of the southern resident killer whales uh, produced by uh, NOAA. And you see that well over three quarters of their diet is one species of salmon, okay? Uh, the rest of it is also all salmon, but different species, okay? But just one species, the Chinook salmon, makes up over three quarters of their diet, okay? So these animals are specialized on Chinook salmon in particular. And when you have such a specialized uh, um, hunting technique, which we think uh, is culturally transmitted because it, it takes a lot uh, of time to learn uh, these um, particular hunting techniques, they're quite complex, they require cooperation, awareness of what other animals are doing often, and awareness and knowledge of when and where these resources are going to show up. So, um, you know, killer whale pods will show up at particular river mouths uh, when timed to coincide with the, 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 the peaks of the Chinook salmon runs in those, in those rivers. There's knowledge of habitat and prey uh, behavior and the nature of the prey that is required in order to develop these foraging tactics. Now when you have them and you persist in having them over generations, so your, your culturally transmitted foraging specialization persists over multiple generations, then you're into the area where gene culture coevolution can occur. And there's evidence for this in killer whales, in this paper, Genome Culture Coevolution uh, of Killer Whale Ecotypes. And what you've got plotted here is uh, in black, the average genome-wide difference between populations of different ecotypes, so transients and Antarctic bee, for example, and residents. And then in red, you've got the observed distance for particular genes associated with the processing of dietary protein. And you see these long red branches indicating that actually the animal's genome is way more different there than you would expect on average, okay, across 
across the whole genome, and that's interpreted as being uh, evidence for selection of that particular locus. And it's interesting that these are all the ones that show evidence for selection. The most strong ones are on to do with the methionine cycle and the processing of dietary protein. Okay, so if you are specialising on seals, for example, you need a slightly different protein metabolism than if you specialise on fish. And so we see the effect of these culturally transmitted um, uh, learning, uh, these culturally transmitted foraging tactics feeding back into the genetic evolution of the species. Um, <clears throat> provocatively, we can also suggest that maybe uh, the uh, process that we see going on in the evolution of these ecotypes as they specialise onto different particular resources, that can brings with it risk, okay, so if three quarters of your diet is Chinook salmon and Chinook salmon undergo some kind of population crust themselves, then you're in, you're in real trouble, okay, but this process is how a population and a species, or populations of a species can come and, and move into an area and begin to exploit its resources by learning about their distribution in space and time and learning the tactics that are needed in order to process this prey. And we think this might be an interesting model for early human evolution where it's quite clear that the level of complexity uh, is, is way, way more than the simple linear progression that is sometimes presented in human evolution. Okay, so multiple um, papers suggesting that there were really quite um, different lineages of, of what we would still call model hu modern humans or, or, or organisms that are highly related to modern humans coexisting uh, and probably having different ways of making their living in particular places. The other thing that's interesting about this uh, system of killer whales is that killer whales are also one of the few non-human mammals that show menopause and that we can draw direct linkages and these scientists have over a string of really influential papers uh, between this idea of ecological knowledge being embedded in older individuals and that selecting for the evolution of menopause, so a long post-reproductive lifespan uh, for females. And it seems that female killer whales uh, have evolved menopause in order to do two things. One is to um, reduce competition with their own uh, daughters uh, in raising offspring and, in, and instead helping their own daughters raise offspring by transmitting knowledge uh, and, and sharing food that they have acquired um, instead of actually having their own, their own offspring. So there's a fascinating story to follow up there as well. And I'm going to close uh, nearly, nearly at the end here. I'm going to start my closing by um, pointing out that all we've discussed today is four species, but there are over 80 species in the cetacean clade. So to my mind, there's a massive opportunity there to learn more from a comparative perspective about the evolution of culture by looking at these processes across a range of cetacean species. And finally, Andy will probably have spoken about the, the relationship between animal culture and conservation. Uh, we have collectively, many of the people on this course, published this paper in uh, this, this forum piece in, in science about why animal cultures matter for conservation. I just want to give one example, one quite interesting example, which is how many cetacean species uh, learn to take advantage of the opportunities that we provide through our fishing uh, activities in, in their habitat. So I'm going to show you a video now, which is actually from a camera mounted on a long line, okay, which is a long line that is deployed with hooks on it, uh, and it's a fishing method used in many places around the world. But the result is that for several hours there are these lines with fish hooked on them, uh, ready for anyone who wants to come along uh, and have a go, and this is what we're going to see in this video. What you hear are the echolocation clicks of a sperm whale, okay, it's very close and it is clearly focused on this, this particular part of the long line. And there is the sperm whale, but I want you to notice that it doesn't go for the fish directly, it actually just takes the line in its mouth, and because the line is under such tension, this creates uh, the kind of jerky movement that eventually leads to one of the fish being dislodged from the hook, and you'll see that in a second, there's a fish floating off. Okay, it's become dislodged by the effects of the sperm whale interacting with the line. Once that happens, the sperm whale releases the line uh, and the fish doesn't, it's dead, it doesn't swim over to the sperm whale, but the sperm whale has muscles in its throat that can generate suction and it seems that it does so quite effectively here and that's a nice easy meal for a sperm whale. Okay? Now this behaviour uh, has actually spread much like the lobtail feeding in, in um, bottlenose, in, in um, humpback whale populations 
uh, over a period of time, and it is done so in a way that is entirely consistent with social science wave of advance models that have been used to describe the spread of innovations across space and time. So it starts in one particular place, okay, in southeast Alaska, and then it spreads east and west from that direction. So these dots are just reports of this depredation behaviour going on. Okay, so that's me. Uh, I'm going to close out there. Uh, the notes will be online and you can follow up the readings that I've given. I'd just like to finish by thanking all the funders who've contributed to this work over the many years that we've been involved with it. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you.